Hey everyone, welcome back. We are going over uh, the rest of our uh, chapter five. So this is chapter five, we're starting on slide 26. We've talked about the epidermis, we've talked about the dermis and glands. Now we're talking about hair, nails, and some uh, interesting skin conditions. So let's talk about hair first. We have hair in lots of places on our body, some more than others. Uh, it's found everywhere or can be found everywhere except where you find thick skin like the palms and your soles and also some parts of your, some other parts of your body like your lips and portions of your genitalia. Um, hair is made of epithelial cells. It's kind of an extension of the epidermis. Take a look at this diagram over here. You can see the epidermis. But the hair just kind of continues down and around. All that is hair. So hair is made of epithelial cells. Glands are too. We saw how glands kind of dive deeper into the skin, but still extend to the surface. They're also made of epithelial cells. Hair and glands are both made of epithelial cells. The difference between hair and the glands that we've been seeing, like this, the eccrine and apocrine pseudoriferous, eccrine and apocrine pseudoriferous are made of a single layer of cells. Hair is always multiple layered. If you don't mind me fast forwarding to slide 29, bottom right picture, here's the cross section of hair. Look at the layers of cells here. There's many layers going around here in the circle. Or if we look at this longitudinal section, look at how many layers of cells there are. With glands, it's only a layer, a or at least with the apocrine and eccrine pseudoriferous, it's only a single layer. Going back to slide 26. Like, we're gonna see uh, many parallels between epidermis and hair. Like the epidermis, Hair is mostly dead cells, and then the living cells are found deeper. The living cells are found in this portion called the hair bulb. It's bulbous, it's round. That's the hair bulb. Most of the hair that you see, or all of the hair that you see is dead. That's why if you cut it, it's no big deal. It can come off. The hair that is alive is deeper. The part of the hair that is living and undergoes mitosis is called the, the hair matrix. If we look at this bulb at the bottom right, this illustration, the hair matrix is within the bulb. It's these cells in this region that I've highlighted in green. That's the hair matrix. The hair matrix is a lot like stratum basale because in the hair matrix, you do have keratinocytes that undergo mitosis and they push up. So these cells undergo mitosis and they push up to form new hair. They extend upward to form the hair shaft. The hair shaft is the dead, the dead cells that push upward. These are hair shafts. This is part of the hair shaft, what you see. The hair follicle, the word follicle is referring to the, uh, the part of the hair that's anchoring it to the skin. So the part that's actually within the skin is the hair follicle. You have dermal and epidermal layers. There's more detail to it than that. We're not gonna go into that much detail. Uh, so this is as much as I'm asking you to know. Also like skin or like epidermis, in the epidermis we saw stratum basale and then deep to it you have the dermal papilla and the dermal papilla had blood vessels that gave nutrients to stratum basale. Similarly, we have a hair papilla. This hair papilla is a bump that's bordering the hair matrix and can give nutrients to the hair matrix. 
The hair papilla is made of connective tissue, has blood vessels, has fibroblasts. The blood vessels can give nutrients. One more parallel between epidermis and hair matrix, specifically stratum basale and hair matrix. Stratum basale had melanocytes. The hair matrix also has melanocytes interspersed. You have melanocytes that are producing pigment, giving your hair color. When melanocytes die, that's when your hair starts turning gray. Melanocytes aren't producing pigment anymore, and you get this sort of, well, not absence of color, but a grayer, whiter color. Hair can sense fine touch. When you lightly touch your hair, uh, you know that your hair is being touched. Um, that means you need nerve endings. So here's yet another receptor. This is called the root hair plexus. You can't see it with our histology, but you can assume that looking in the bulb region, there's branches of, of nerve endings coming off. Sensory nerve endings. Um, you can see that in this bottom left picture, the diagram, these nerve endings are represented here, root hair plexus. Our hair can also be moved. Uh, you can get goosebumps, goose pimples, some people call them. Um, your hair is literally being pulled. This usually happens if you're cold or if you feel a certain emotion. Um, so that's what I mean by nerve stimulation. Your hair is being pulled by a muscle. It's smooth muscle. This muscle is called erector pili. Erector means to stand up, like to erect. So it helps your hair stand up. Pili literally means hair. So it makes your hair stand up, erector pili. In our diagram at the bottom left, you can see that it's always going in a diagonal up. There's the erector pili. In our histology, uh, look at the top right. In our histology, the erector pili is shown here, going at a diagonal. That's smooth muscle going at a diagonal. You can also see some of it here in this cross section. <clears throat> Another more histology, so you can compare uh, and see what all these things look like. You can see hair. All these cut pieces here are hair. And we're looking at the top left diagram, top left histology. You can see the epidermis is dark at the top. And that same epithelial tissue extends down where the hair is. The bulb is the deepest part. And if we zoom in on the bulb down here, you can see the dermal papilla. That's what DP is. Here's the dermal papilla. And you can also see the matrix surrounding it. That's the hair matrix. And these cells undergo mitosis and form more hair. Once again, we know we're looking at hair and not a gland. Hair still has a lumen. Like if you remove the hair, there's a space here. That's a lumen. It's not a gland. Um, because we, we see that there's multiple layers of cells here going around in a circle. If you see a single layer of cells going around in a circle, that's a lumen of a sebaceous, or excuse me, that's a lumen of an eccrine or an apocrine pseudoriferous gland. We can draw this on our diagram, the one that we're working on before. We have our hair already drawn here. The bulb of our hair is here. The shaft is what's exposed. The follicle is what anchors it to the skin. The living part of hair 
is down here in the bulb. This is the hair matrix where we can find what are mostly keratinocytes. And then sometimes you can find, which I'm going to color in blue, melanocytes, just like in Stratobase Alley. That bump there, this is where you can find blood vessels. This is the dermal, excuse me, not dermal papilla, this is the hair papilla. And the hair papilla has blood vessels to nourish the hair matrix so it can grow. In that bulb region, you have nerve endings. So I'm going to draw a nerve ending here. That nerve ending, that is called <clears throat> a root hair plexus. The root hair plexus detects movement of the hair. And also, if you pull the hair out, it's why it's painful, because you've got nerve endings there. You also have smooth muscle that can pull on the hair. Smooth muscle is always at a diagonal. Going up. This is the erector. Pili. Switching back to the slides, a quick recap of what we've just discussed and tying this back to what we've learned about with development. All of that dermis that we've discussed and, 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 and the hypodermis subcutaneous, all that came from mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells produce the dermis and the hypodermis because it's all connective tissue. While epithelial cells, which came from ectoderm, epithelial cells produce the epidermis, what you see here in blue, all the glands and hair. They all come from the same embryonic germ layer. They're the same tissue type. Nails are another accessory organ of the integumentary system and they're a lot like hair. Nails, the outer portion, the part, hard part, is also made of dead keratinocytes. It's actually a different, it's keratin, but it's a special form of keratin. There's a difference between soft keratin and hard keratin. There's a reason why your hair and nails are one texture while your skin is another texture. But it's still keratin. And so that's as much as I would like you to know. There are keratinocytes forming your nail plate. Dead keratinocytes form your nail plate, also called your nail body. That's the part of your nail that's showing, the superficial part. That's the nail plate. It's hard. If you were to, and this is a little, makes me a little squeamish, if you were to remove your nail, the hard part of your nail, you would see tissue underneath it. The tissue underneath is your nail bed. The nail bed is living tissue. 
This is, has blood vessels, this has nerves. The nail bed is underneath. In the sagittal section, you can see it's underneath, deep to it. With hair, we saw that hair grew from a hair matrix in the deepest part. Same thing for nails. In this area where I'm coloring blue, this is called nail matrix. This is where you can find keratinocytes undergoing mitosis and producing more nail. It's why our nails grow out distally. This, where you find the nail matrix, this area is called the nail root. So just like how we have a hair bulb, hair root, there's a nail matrix within the nail root. Let me draw that, um, I'm gonna go out of order here, but let me draw that matrix again. Look down here at the bottom. You can see the matrix, I'm coloring it in blue. So you can't actually get, you can't um, see your new matrix exposed, but you see evidence that your matrix exists. If you look at your nail, so now look at the top picture. If you look at your nail, you see this kind of opaque, colored shape. It's kind of moon shaped. This is called the, this is termed the lunula. You can see an opaque coloring or something that isn't as red if you don't have your nails painted. You can see this lunula because it's the matrix showing through. It's that part of the matrix, the most distal part of the matrix showing through your nail. Your nail is fairly clear and you're not seeing any blood vessels because you've got a large amount of cells there. Those are matrix cells in the way. The rest of the redness that you see underneath your nail, that's part of the nail bed. You have lots of blood vessels there. You still have blood vessels in the deeper part, but they're just covered by nail matrix cells. So the lunula, is because of your nail matrix. The dead flaky skin that you see on top of your nail, that's your cuticle. And your cuticle is an extension of this thickened skin. This thickened skin is called the eponychium. Epo, like epi, means on top on top of the base of your nail. Nicium, N-Y-C-H, is referring to your nail. It's a hard, C, hard K sound, nicium, eponicium. The cuticle extends on top of the nail plate. The eponicium is thickened skin. Together, the eponicium and cuticle, together the eponicium and cuticle are protecting this part of your nail. It's possible, let's say there's bacteria or fungus, it could make its way deeper into your skin and you don't want that, you don't want a nail infection. And that can happen, say, if you have a, uh, if you mess up a, a manicure or something. You don't want bacteria to get in there. So we cover it up with the cuticle and eponychium, protect that area. Similarly, we want to protect the underneath part of the nail. Underneath the nail, this is called the hyponychium. Hypo means below, hyponychium. So the hyponychium is protecting this portion of your nail. Eponychium on top, hyponychium underneath. Here is another view, uh, <clears throat> cross, top, or top left and bottom left are showing a cross section. And then this is from an actual cadaver uh, cross section. You can see here's bone, uh, here's dermis, and then the nail is the top part here. In this longitudinal section, We can see 
the nail has been removed. So let me draw where the nail would be. Mm, that's exaggerated. That's a long nail. So this would be the nail plate. The nail bed is this tissue here. So the nail bed is the living tissue underneath. The matrix would be found around this area. It's not really delineated in any particular way, but it would be found in this nail root area. You can see the eponychium covering on top. You can see the hyponychium protecting underneath. Let me show you one more diagram, our histology, that shows this. This is a composite of three different view, fields of view because the nail is pretty big, but this is a slice of a fingernail at 40x or a slice of the whole finger, I should say. The nail plate, once again, is removed. So if we were to draw it in, it's roughly like that. So this is nail plate. The nail bed is the tissue deep to it. Hyponychium is the thickened tissue here. I've exaggerated the color, but that's hard to read. And then you can see the eponychium and the cuticle would extend on top of the nail plate. Matrix. is under all of that. And because the nail matrix is showing through the nail, what you see there is the lunula. What you see on top of your nail is the lunula. All right, switching back to slides. We are on slide 34. We've discussed hair, we've discussed nails. Now let's talk about some common and important to discuss skin conditions. There's obviously a ton of skin conditions. We're only gonna highlight some of them. First, we're gonna highlight skin burns. You may be familiar with skin burns, especially maybe this one. This is the most common one since it's the most minor and easiest to get. A first degree burn, first degree is the least, uh, least damaging, still damage, least damaging. You're only damaging the epidermis. So if you look at this skin section here, this illustration, we see damage limited to the epidermis. I'm drawing the border of the epidermis right now. Damage is limited to the epidermis. When you damage the epidermis, you're damaging keratinized stratified squamous cells. Um, and that's mostly what you're damaging, just the keratinized stratified squamous. In response to that damage, what your body does is that it dilates blood vessels. The word dilate, dilation, means to open up. In, you have a blood vessel and you make that blood vessel wider. You dilate it. Blood vessels dilate and you're bringing more blood so that you can speed up healing. So the purpose of dilating your blood vessels in this case is to speed up healing of the damaged skin. Because it gets because these blood vessels dilate, the blood vessels in the areolar connective tissue in the papillary layer, that leads to skin redness and skin sensitivity, hallmarks of a first degree burn. Look, it appears red because blood vessels have dilated, sensitive because 
nerve endings respond to damage. Nerve endings respond to damage. Second degree burns are more severe. They go deeper. They are damaging the dermis. When you have a second degree burn, you can see the dermis here, I'm outlining it. You have damage in the epidermis, but now you also have damage in the dermis layer. Because you're damaging this layer, you're, you're damaging keratinized stratified squamous from the epidermis, but you're damaging areolar connective tissue and potentially dense irregular connective tissue. Remember, you also find receptors there. You could be damaging nerve endings. You could be damaging glands, like sebaceous sudoriferous glands. When you, when you damage past the epidermis, remember that the layer or the substance, I should say, the layer of proteins in between the epidermis and dermis is the basement membrane. It's supposed to be this attaching glue attaches the epidermis to the dermis. You're damaging that when you have a second degree burn. When that gets damaged, the epidermis can lift off. And when it lifts off, it, you no longer have those uh, hemidesmosomes attaching to the basement membrane. Epidermis lifts off and interstitial fluid now enters this space. That's what a blister is. A blister is when you damage basement membrane, interstitial fluid from the connective tissue enters the space because normally the epidermis should be attached, but no, it's no longer attached. We fill it up with fluid. So blistering is a hallmark characteristic of secondary burns. It's painful and red because you've damaged nerve endings. Blisters are a sign of second degree burns. You damage down to the dermis. From here, and it's gonna get a little more graphic. Um, from here, uh, I've heard of fourth degree and more burns. We'll just leave it at three. Three we'll say is the most severe. A third degree burn goes down into the hypodermis or even farther than that could get down to the bone, to muscle. Because you've damaged this far down, those accessory organs, glands, hair, have been damaged. You've damaged the, the hair matrix, hair may not never go back again. You've damaged the glands, you may never sweat in that area again. You've damaged nerve endings, you won't feel anything in that area. Now I know that sounds like a, I don't want to say positive thing, but you're not feeling pain, but you've lost all the important structures in this area. When you have a burn that's this severe, you require a skin graft. This area of skin needs to be replaced with healthy skin that can regrow with fibroblasts and uh, keratinocytes and stratum basale. You can see how severe this is. It's no longer serving as a protective layer. It's all damaged and dead. Those are your three basic degrees of burn. First degree, epidermis, second degree, dermis, third degree, hypodermis or deeper. I wanted to talk about two different pigment conditions. Um, this first one here is called vitiligo. Vitiligo is a loss of pigment because melanocytes, those melanocytes found in stratum basale, they start dying. The reason why they die, not fully understood. This is an immune immunology question. Uh, they're slowly destroyed by your own white blood cells. So it's an autoimmune condition. Autoimmune is where your own immune system attacks yourself. Again, not fully understood. So the melanocytes are dying, parts of your skin lose pigment. 
The biggest drawback here, the reason why we have pigment is that now this area of skin is more susceptible to damage from UV light, from ultraviolet light. So it's important for all people to protect their skin from ultraviolet light, but especially people with vitiligo, especially the areas of skin that are not pigmented. There are some other comorbidities, other conditions that go along with vitiligo. Since this is an autoimmune disease, this often leads to other autoimmune conditions, but that's really the biggest drawback here. There could also be some social uh, ramifications, of course, but um, yeah, that's just humans being weird. Um, physically, the biggest thing is that you can't get uh, protection from UV radiation. If you have work, if you have melanocytes, but melanocytes can no longer produce melanin because of a mutation in the DNA, DNA instructions for melanin. Remember, melanin is a protein, and DNA are instructions for proteins. If there's something incorrect in the instructions, you won't make melanin. If you don't make melanin, you don't have pigment, whether it's in your skin or even your eyes. This condition is called albinism. Albinism. Alba means light, white. So albinism means you're absent of pigment, you're light colored. <clears throat> this loss of pigment leads to, as you guessed it, light sensitivity. If you don't have pigment, your eyes can't uh, deal with as much light, your skin can't deal with as much light. Your, your skin becomes sensitive. We've talked about Skin burn types, we've talked about two different uh, skin pigment conditions. I also want to talk about some examples of skin cancer. This is one example of skin cancer. It's called basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell, that means it's coming from stratum basale. Carcinoma, the word or the root word oma means growth and carcin means cancerous. So it's a cancerous growth that starts in stratum basale, basal cell carcinoma. So these are coming from keratinocytes. And they grow more than normal. We said that normally mitosis should happen in response to overall normal growth and development or if you have damaged tissue, you're replacing damaged tissue. But here, cells are growing in just because, because there's a mutation and they just continually grow over and over and over. They're growing when they shouldn't grow. They're undergoing mitosis when they shouldn't undergo mitosis. Fortunately, for most people who get this, it is a relatively slow growing. The mitosis doesn't happen so rapidly. And the benefit is because if you catch it early, if you catch a cancerous growth early, you can remove it. The problem of catching a cancerous growth too late is that it can spread to other tissues via blood vessels or sometimes lymph vessels. We'll talk about lymph vessels later, but it can spread through blood vessels. Blood vessels are found in the dermis, not in the epidermis. So if it starts growing down, if these cells start growing deeper into the dermis, it can then spread to other tissues of the body. The word for spreading to other tissues of the body, that's called metastasis. Metastasis. The verb is to metastasize. If a cancer metastasizes, it's spread to other places. And that's really bad because now you've got, what, if, a, if a cell breaks off and spreads elsewhere, it can grow its own tumor elsewhere, it can grow a tumor in another place and another place. And now it's hard to, to take care of. If it's condensed in one place, you can just remove it all and you're, you're done with it. If it's growing in, in really, really important places like your brain or your heart or other places, it, these cancer cells can alter the function of those organs. And we don't want to alter the function of our organs. We need them to, to live. So basal cell carcinoma starts in stratum basale, 
rarely metastasizes. You want to try to catch this early. So if you see a growth on your skin, and I'll give you some tips on how to identify what's an irregular growth, see a doctor and get it, get it dealt with. The next type of cancer, skin cancer, is called <clears throat> squamous cell carcinoma. All the cells of your epidermis are squamous cells. So where is this coming from? It's coming from that next layer up, stratum spinosum, coming from here. They grow to the surface. This is the second most common. This is a bit faster growing. Sometimes they metastasize. So they could grow deeper and spread to other, cell, other tissues. These are faster growing. The third type that I wanna go over is the most deadly of the three. This is called melanoma. It's coming from melanocytes. Melanocytes also found in stratum basale. So you have, if you have overly mitotic melanocytes, they can push up to the surface of the skin, which produces a dark colored, irregular looking mole type thing. But if they grow deeper, if these cells break off and get into the bloodstream or lymphatic vessels, that's when it can metastasize. So this is a very dangerous one because it spreads very quickly. The mitosis here is very rapid. Hopefully I didn't freak you all out. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but if you are concerned, here's what you should look for before you decide to see a doctor. Use this A, B, C, D, E rule. I'm not actually gonna test you this on the test. I just want you to know, because it's important. But the A in A, B, C, D, E stands for asymmetric. Look for asymmetry. Is, a, is something growing on your skin uh, even looking or does it have an irregular shape? If it's irregular, that's a sign that you should go to the doctor. B stands for border. Is it a clear, distinct border or is it a very irregular border? If it's irregular, see a doctor. Color, C stands for color. If it's a uniform color, it's probably a benign mole. If it's uneven colored, different shades, see a doctor. Is the diameter irregular or is it, is it small? If it's a small diameter, less than six millimeters, break out your ruler, the metric side. Um, if it's less than six millimeters, probably don't have anything to worry about. If it's bigger than that, see a doctor, <laughs> get it checked out. It's also important if you're concerned to track growths on your skin over time. Use a frame of reference, like put a ruler on your skin or put a dime or a penny next to your, next to your growth and take a picture of it. Check it a few weeks later. See if it's evolved over time. Has it changed over time? If there's no change, don't worry about it, Pro probably. <laughs> um, if it has changed in size or shape or color, get it checked out. I also want to emphasize that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in this field of dermatology because most of these skin conditions have been characterized in lighter skin and not in darker skin. You can still get skin cancer if you have darker skin, even with a lot of melanin, skin cancer is still a possibility. In fact, I don't have the exact numbers of this, but uh, skin cancer, say in uh, black people, is the, the deaths that result from, from skin cancer in black people is relatively high because it goes misdiagnosed or, or not diagnosed. Um, there's one really cool Instagram page, Joel Burvell. Let me show you him real quick. He shows, uh, he highlights different skin conditions in people of color. Uh, so I encourage you to check him out. How dermatology problems look different in black versus white skin. Um, it, it, it's going to look different because skin color is different and it's going to appear different because it's not going to appear as red or different shades of dark, different shades of brown you'll need to characterize it differently. So um, I hope that was helpful. That's the end of our chapter five integumentary system. Uh, you learned about the epidermis, dermis, hypodermis a little bit, uh, hair, 
nails, glands, and some skin conditions. Please let me know if you have questions, leave questions in the comments in the, in the discussion. And yeah, I'll get back to you. Thanks everyone, have a good day.